the Beatles were British, yes, but, but the, they got their start rock and roll. covering American rock and roll musicians. Yeah. When John Lennon stepped out of line, the American <laughs> government made sure that he knew it. <laughs> what hurt him harder, Yoko Ono or the American government? <laughs> you decide. How's it going folks? Welcome back to the Chill Zone. I'm Jack here to answer some of the hardest hitting questions such as how Americans got this dumb. Uh, the answer is quite simple. You are number one. <laughs> no, no, on a serious note though, I, I gotta preface this video by saying one thing. I love Americans. I have families out there. It's a statement that is very close to saying that I'm not racist, but no, that I genuinely think that you guys are very awesome. You're super entertaining. And I guess that because of this entertainment industry, uh, it's very more apparent than other places around the world how some of you can be rather stupid. Now, this is a video by Brit Monkey, a channel that I highly recommend that you subscribe to. Very informative, but delivered in a very funny manner. And uh, yeah, I, I, he's going to answer whether or not that is true. And well, I guess the statement is that it is true, but how it got that bad. You want to know how I got this dislike ratio? <laughs> I make a video praising the Soviet Union and nobody bats an eye. I make a <laughs> video praising the United States and everybody loses their minds. Okay, fine. I hear you. You only want to hear bias. things that confirm what you already believe. I get it. Let's talk about why Americans are stupid. By the way, let's increase the... Mm, I, I forget, he's a 720 guy. Of course. <laughs> There's a famous episode of the Jimberly Kimberly live show where clueless residents of Los Angeles fail to name a single country. Is this South Africa? We yeah, have the country of Asia. Greenland or Iceland or something. Although these are no doubt cherry Yes, it's cherry picked. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say a word. Let's keep going. Very picked, and I'm sure if you stood in a big city all day and shoved a camera in people's faces and asked them questions, you'd be able to find three <laughs> minutes worth of people who couldn't answer on the spot. Miss, for a dollar, name a woman. Name a woman? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the crowder types. Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm. That guy. God damn it. Of course, it's going to happen to anybody to be locked like that, but simply just saying, me? <laughs> But the stereotype that Americans are ignorant about the wider world is largely true. These people can't name a country because they don't care about other countries. 40% of Americans have a passport. That would be the main point that I would make. Why would you need to? No, like seriously, why would you need to? You have a whole continent-sized country. Like, I came to something like, let's say, Australia. Right, where people only inhabit the borders, but you guys actually inhabit the middles. But nobody wants to live in the middle. <laughs> but like you have enough biodiversity to have almost all types of weather. Now I, as an example, if I were to go to my country of birth, right, in Cameroon, I need to go to Mount Cameroon, which is our volcano, at the peak of that, or travel to some other country like freaking Kenya if I wanted to experience snow, okay? <laughs> That's how far I need to go. But for you guys, it's a relative just quick plane ride. Of course, the infrastructure is a completely different question. So like, it's, it's a massive country. So obviously I understand that people don't see the need of venturing outside. Compared to 66% of Canadians and 76% of Brits. In 1994, mm. it was only 10% of Americans. But that doesn't mean Americans have gotten more globetrotting since then. No. It was because after an above average the Americans. Of the news, it became mandatory to need a passport when entering Canada and Mexico. Bruh. So it's fair to say that a very small percent of Americans will be leaving this corner of the world. As I said in a previous video, America has all you'd ever want geographically within her borders. Yep. Why go anywhere else? You don't have that train infrastructure though. <laughs> I'm only making fun of that because like it, it, the result of such thing ends up being like some billionaire high on his own bullshit making a boring tunnel where cars are getting stuck in. The foreign cultures maybe? Americans don't care about that either. On the list of the highest grossing movies in the USA, you have to go all the way to 520th place to get a movie that isn't American. <laughs> Borat. 
<laughs> and then <laughs> the naughty professor, Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, the ring. Oh, is that other one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But man, that's far down. But obviously, that kind of makes sense though. Like, you spend a lot of money on your entertainment industry. So, obviously, the majority of the things that you're going to see is going to be yours. Until, of course, you get access to like international cinema, like Korean cinema, which won an Oscar, and everybody was like, <gasps> movies outside of the US can be good. It's Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, by the way. Couldn't even beat the nutty professor. Somebody please check up on Angley. I think he might have killed himself. <laughs> Neither do global affairs hold the average American's interest. When asked about the Kyoto Climate Accords, who the Taliban are, or who Nicolas Sarkozy is, Americans are woefully underinformed compared to other developed nations. Hey, hey, who's right there on the top? It's us. It's us. <laughs> no, but seriously, the Taliban. Understand not knowing about the Frenchman, but the Taliban, that's like, that's like the evil ex that you don't want to talk about. It's like sworn enemies. They have, they tell like on your favorite social media platform, man, they, they have Twitter. <laughs> they took over the country and found out that ruling is difficult. Now they are tweeting like crazy. <laughs> we want to go back. In 2009, only half knew that last year's Olympics were held in Beijing. Oh, but of course, when asked to name American celebrities, they had no trouble at all. Is that Ivanka? Pfft, Ivanka, oh my god. I, I, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Well, according to the standard, I don't, I don't even know the name of Trump's wife, so that's good enough for me. She, I, I don't know those celebrities. Wait, she's M Melania Trump. <laughs> Melania Trump. Oh my God. <laughs> Melania Blade of Nicola. <laughs> At the same time, we non-Americans are flooded with American culture. Some British yeah, people are. know more about American politics and history than their own. That's basically... Yeah, well... Okay, I wanted to make a comparison to how colonialism has affected some countries. Like, I know more about the rest of the world than I actually know about my own culture. <laughs> so, yeah. So dropped into the trench, depth or the Z axis is It's Z, Z axis, you floppy haired moron. France had to pass laws banning radio stations from playing too much American music. Wow. There are only two countries Did in the that. world where Coca Cola is not sold. Wait, scratch that. This journalist from Finland bought a Coke at a water park in Pyongyang in 20... Wait a minute. Myth busting in North Korea. You can even buy Coca-Cola here for the USA. 1.5 per can at Monsoon Water Park, bottled in Denmark. Hey. <laughs> 2017. And what's this hiding in the background of somebody's holiday snaps at the National Hotel de Cuba? Look, hmm. you know something's up when remote tribesmen in the Amazon rainforest who don't even have electricity know who Michael Jackson is. I mean, it's the king of pop, though. Americans used to be quite well read. After the Second World War, Americans consumed 63% of all the newspapers in the world, and they used this to their advantage. There was a good reason for that. And mind you, I know that I've been pausing like crazy right now, but uh, th this might be an important thing for you to know. But perhaps you already know this, but I'm still going to go a little bit on the rant here. So, so in America's wonderful effort to continue spreading freedom of speech and uh, democracy all around the world, that is before even the Second World War, uh, initiatives were taken to maintain democracy's purity, making sure that uh, things didn't go awry. And the way that they knew that this could happen would be in contrast to what the big corporation could do. As they saw them gaining more power, people thought that, uh, well, perhaps they should be regulated more. And this, of course, also meant the news. Now, I'm not too sure if it was in the 40s or the, before the Second World War that they enacted the Fairness Act. But uh, let me actually see. No, it was in the 40s, the 49. But before that was something called the Radio Act. And the Radio Act uh, kind of affected the transmission of the news. And it was so that the regulation were put on radio stations so that if they started to spread things that were kind of fringe topics uh, and it was not in the interest of the people for the sovereignty, uh, they could lose the license uh, so that they could no longer 
broadcast anything. And also came the Fairness Act that was enacted with alongside the FCC, which meant that uh, the uh, well radio stations and or broadcasting station whatever needed to take some of the time to later then discuss fringe topic from both sides of the issues that people actually cared about so to make sure that the news was unbiased now how does that exactly relate to the newspapers well the people who were spearheading the news who or at least were the role model for all around the world the unlikely source of that was the new york time because I remember in school, we were once given like a course on how to uh, deduce whether or not you can find bias in text, where the New York Times actually was one of the pieces of material that we had to work with. And yes, I was surprised too, knowing how the American news is today, how unbiased it actually was. It was super neutral because the guiding star was objectivity. They refused to add their own opinion, uh, used neutral language, refused to interpret words even, so that it could be taken out of context. All that to make sure that the news that was spread were accurate and objective and were the best one to be also shipped all around the world. Now, obviously, that did not last long because post-World War, we had something called the Rare Scare. For all of you boys who have, um, or, or ladies, who have gone out there to watch Oppenheimer, you will know the shit that happened to him, how he was called spy, simply by saying that perhaps we should new kind of people. Essentially, the Rare Scare, or McCarthyism, as it is also called, was this tactic that was employed by McCarthy, uh, who insinuated that there was a communist revolt going on in the US and it should be stopped. Obviously, that wasn't true. But as he went down, people started going against the news because they thought them to be complicit since they did not step in, since their role was simply to just be objective and not take side. And because of that, and of course all the upheaval that was going on in the US at the time, the institution of journalism, which was mostly led by liberals at the time, became very left-leaning and took those uh, political standing. Whereas later on with the arrival of Ronald Reagan, some of you guys are slow and savior. Uh, <laughs> God damn. <laughs> I'm sorry for saying that. Um, he wanted to make news more profitable and ended up then making the bias on the right wing side. For that very reason, then you started seeing a lot of bias in the US news. But essentially, the US used to be of the highest standard and promoted that freedom of expression, but still with a focus on objectivity. And that's why it was actually very well uh, acclaimed, critically acclaimed all around the world. In 1948, the newly formed United Nations created a list of human rights that all countries should strive to uphold. One area that Americans were particularly interested in was this one, Article 19. Mm. Everyone has the right to freedom of expression and opinion and receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Yeah. What the USA wanted was a completely level playing field. Anyone can buy any media from any other country a global free market of ideas released <laughs> sure from the shackles of censorship for if anyone can gain access to the truth we cannot be marched into the same kind of ignorance and intolerance that characterized the axis nations of the war this yeah that makes sense the more educated you are on certain things the more no knowledgeable you are the more aware you are of whether or not the acts or deeds that you made were right, wrong, or moral, or immoral. This is admirable. Freedom of speech is a core value of the United States and many other allied nations. But some delegates, like those from India, questioned the US's motives. If you believe in an equal access to information and culture, shouldn't you redistribute some of your media creating capacity <laughs> to developing nations like ours, so that we have an equal opportunity to tell the world our stories? No, no, you can't. You can't ask that of the U.S. Man, they, they said free market of idea, <laughs> and by that it means that you should provide with your own news, buddy. If you can't do that, buy ours. That's what we mean by free. The Americans would not budge. Of course, they knew deep down that India was right. The American delegation to the convention was highly populated by journalists and media magnates. Hmm. They knew that if countries couldn't afford their own news, 
they would be increasingly reliant on buying news from American wire companies like the Associated Press, yeah. which was good for both the media company's profits, but also the US State Department, who would- And that's the thing, because back, as I mentioned before, some of the big giants were so talking about NBC, ABC, and who's the third one? That there were three major magnets. CBS, CBS was the last one. They were, at least their subsidiary, were non-profit in the beginning. So they did not make a profit from this, which of course led to Regano Matrix. <laughs> wait, 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 it, it is called Regonomics. Oh my God, I, I'm sorry. Please somebody correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but uh, made it profitable. So it became an incentive to make a lot of money. So it was going to be pushed as hard as possible. Would no doubt have been licking their lips at the prospect of a billion people reading news with a specific American spin on it. Yeah. In 1944, the Associated Press sold news to 38 countries. Mm. Within eight years, that had doubled to 70 countries. Oof. In the 1950s, around half of films shown in European and Asian cinemas were American two-thirds in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. Which makes sense. Americans made grand Technicolor films brimming with Hollywood sparkle because they could afford to. Whereas war-torn Europe, impoverished Mexico, and nuclear-obliterated Japan were stuck making small-scale comedies to keep up morale. Yeah, yeah. Th th One of the most popular French movies in 40s France was 1949's The Big Day a mostly plotless movie where a whimsical French postman gets into wacky mischief in a quaint village. <laughs> there just wasn't the money or resources for anything else. Hollywood captured the European public's imagination, and they wanted more. Yeah. But why is it only a one-way street? Because while you can do or say whatever you want within the United States, the Constitution also says that the American government can regulate what goes in or out. During the Cold War, anything that might be considered communist propaganda could be seized by the post office and never delivered. Remember what happened to your boy Oppenheimer? Books or even souvenirs from communist countries, for example. Pamphlets criticizing US foreign policy. Immigration reached a low point in the early 70s, with only 4.7% of Americans being foreign born, limiting Americans' interaction with different cultures. Yeah. Obviously, it wasn't totally like North Korea. Plenty of foreign movies and music were allowed into the US. But the <laughs> media that caught on was either already Americanized or so plastically exotic that it doesn't really say anything about the Jeez. culture where it's from. The Beatles were British, yes, but, but they, they got their start covering American rock and roll musicians. Yeah. When John Lennon stepped out of line, the American <laughs> government made sure that he knew it. <laughs> What hurt him harder, Yoko Ono or the American government? <laughs> you decide. Movies imported from Japan were mostly samurai flicks, and very few movies set in the modern day. The film Ikiru is widely considered the best Japanese film ever made, if you ignore people who have never felt the touch of a woman. <laughs> but this existential drama about a depressed, lonely man was only given a limited release in California, and the poster was edited to feature a stripper who is only in the movie for like one minute. Come on, come on, you wet, come on. You can't be serious. You have got to be kidding me. So like, imagine this, my dad is a huge collector of Kurosawa films. Like, if you don't know Kurosawa, one of the greatest instructor of uh, samurai movies in Japan. And think about basically um, Ghost of Tsushima, the video game, but like in that filter in black and white. The, the feelings that you're getting from that, basically the stuff that he did. But <laughs> imagine, I'm just imagining him wanting to show me part of his collection and it's just covers of like strippers on it. <laughs> like, what the f The narrow stream of European movies that made it into the USA came in the form of the French New Wave Cinema. Yeah. Movies that were stylistically inspired by American films, but also so stuffy that few audiences would ever want to watch them anyway. Qu'est-ce que ça peut être? Ça ne va pas, non? No, rien. Je voulais dire cette phrase avec une idée précise. Je ne savais pas quelle était la meilleure façon d'exprimer cette idée. Ou plutôt, je le savais. Yeah, it helped with the melancholy. 
This was further stifled by the Hayes Code, a set of extremely strict regulations oh, that were in go. place from 1934 to 1968. Freedom of expression, huh? Yeah, the part where you don't even, you aren't even allowed to kiss on screen. If you've ever wondered why old black and white films seem so dry, it's because of these rules. Some things that were completely banned from ever being shown in any film included <laughs> bad guys winning, all movies had to end with the police outwitting the evil criminals or what? the criminals causing their own demise. Okay, any I did not know. nudity, even the uh, silhouette of a booba is an instant ban. Blood or dead bodies. When people get shot in old films, they usually just clutch the wound, but no actual blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the detective noir. <laughs> the thing that basically inspired the cyberpunk genre today, like had zero blood and gore. Like a tough nut cop that would go out of his way to like uh, deal with the bad guys in his own way and occasionally brutalize them. <laughs> no blood at all. But is seen. Pointing a gun at somebody in the same frame. This is why guns are always held at waist height. Kissing for longer than three seconds. <laughs> Interracial couples. Oh, of course. White people as slaves. <laughs> Criticism of religion or of any other country. Now that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> They wanted to ensure that Birth of a Nation would have never been made in the reverse. Never. <laughs> Being <to> no. <laughs> we don't want to show that at the audience. Are you crazy? <laughs> but you, you want to know one thing that I found out recently? Is that although many people believe that in the Constitution there is actual separations of church and state, it isn't, it isn't there. It doesn't say that at all. It's not explicitly stated in the constitution, which is why a lot of murky territory goes on and how some people are oppressed by religious beliefs in the US. Like, I, I can pull this up here. Also, just as a little clarification, used to be a Bible teacher, no longer am, so that's why I kind of know some of this stuff researched that in the past but this is from the everson v board of education case of ed wing and the judge here did note the following uh on established religion actually let me zoom that a little bit so you can see it better neither state nor federal government can set up church neither can pass laws which aid one religion aid all religions or uh, prefer one religion over another neither can force nor influence a person to go to or remain away from church against its will or force him to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion we can move further on to the rest here saying that in the words of jefferson was well, so the intent uh, the clause against establishment of religion by law was intended to erect a wall of separations between church and state so it's a definition based on intent and a thing that it's kind of funny with relation to what he just said with uh, the broadcasting and stuff um, the censorship was not applied for televangelist uh, why actually this prevented the more artistically liberal european films from being shown in american cinemas and when they did get a US release, they were usually edited to remove the <laughs> violence in movies and sex on TV to comply with the good old fashioned values. Upon which we used to At rely. Least until the rules were abolished in 1968 and replaced by the age rating system we have today. Oh, yeah. Even as the Cold War ended and the internet gave Americans unparalleled access to the rest of the world and all of human knowledge, they still preferred to hang out on a handful of American-made websites dominated by Americans. But of course. The insular culture of 20th century America has carried over to <laughs> the 21st. Tightened border security after Septiembre Undecimo means foreign musicians can have a hard time getting visas. In 2002, the touring visa of a German orchestra was cancelled after it was discovered the cellist had a criminal record for shoplifting a pair of tweezers in 1991. When what? Yo! Come on, dude! <laughs> you guys need to relax a little bit. It's just like TSA. 
GSA agents seem to think to themselves that they are freaking SWAT. Calm down. When they tried again for a visa in 2004, the cellist had to undergo an hour-long interview with Homeland Security and had to physically pick up his visa from the US Embassy. Global cultures might be more present in American media, the last summer, right? but they're always through the lens of American characters. The most, <laughs> the most Asian guy, Tom Cruise. <laughs> Such as The Last Samurai starring Tom Cruise, where he plays a white guy in 1870s Japan. Seven Years in Tibet, another American in China. Indiana Jones, American in Egypt. The Born Identity, American in France. Yep. The Glorious Bastards, Americans in German occupied France. And for the ladies in the audience, Mamma Mia. For a movie set on a Greek island, not a there's single not a single Greek, Greek person <laughs> in the entire movie. They're currently doing like some uh, plays of it um, here in Denmark. So uh, yeah, it's been running in commercials. It's, it makes me laugh every single time. Is there any hope for America or are they destined to be a stinky, dumb, redneck country forever? Wow. What a panel. Maybe. In 2000, 92% of the music in the USA Top 50 was American, making it the second most insulated market in the world after Pakistan. But today, it's more like 60%. Okay. With Brits, Canadians, Latin Americans, and Africans making themselves more seen in the charts. Nice. Each year, there are more foreign films nominated at the Academy Awards than ever before. The internet. What used to be an American-only pay-to-win award show is now an international pay-to-win <laughs> award show. As social media platforms have an element of randomness in what they show users, there is a higher chance of Americans being shown videos from other countries, forcing them to take note of what is happening. Yeah. It seems the revolution will be TikToked. It's funny. This... One of the greatest things that the internet has provided us is this ability to communicate while at the same time one can argue that it allows some people to to get in involved in more fringe stuff and get isolated in certain communities which is why this whole thing about banning people tends to be a huge problem uh, or, or, or deplatforming sorry that's what i meant to say uh, it tends to be like a murky territory because it then isolates people uh, in certain areas that only makes them worse. But at the same time, this ability that we get to communicate with one another, uh, different parts of the world, even with the guise of anonymity, allows us just to share, to just showcase just how human we are, <laughs> how equally hateful we are. <laughs> It's, it's like terrifying, but also beautiful, you know? And I, I think that personally, that, that, that is more likely to open us up to have more knowledge and be smarter to make better choices. But what do I know? I've been giving the impression throughout this video that it's all or most Americans who are terminally <laughs> uneducated. But American ignorance isn't as evenly distributed as you'd think. That study I mentioned earlier, when adjusting for English proficiency, income, and education levels, Americans are really no different from their European counterparts. And in <laughs> high income, you don't get to peer into the Danish wallets, buddy. That, that, that that's a no-no zone. In some cases, marginally smarter. Knowledge about the wider world even correlates to political views, yeah, and obviously. not in the way that you'd think. A 2022 survey asked Americans 12 questions about the world, such as who is the British Prime Minister, so that, what does the Indian flag look like, that, and what this symbol represents. Yeah. The people who answered the most questions correctly were committed Democrats and committed Republicans. Obviously, people who are more in, politically engaged make sure to have their, their fact straight. They, they have strong opinions for that reason. They need to be more informed about a lot of things. Whereas the centrist, or as Disco Elysium calls it, uh, the moralist, is just going to go with the flow of their feelings, uh, uh, wanting to secure this ideal that they're chasing, but not necessarily diving deep into things. Yeah, very surface level. Swing voters those enlightened centrist chads were the stupidest. 
Only 40% of moderate Republicans could name the US Secretary of State. I wouldn't know compared that. Compared to 60% of convicted Republicans. Only half of moderate Democrats knew that the US MCA trade agreement replaced NAFTA. No. Compared to 66% of convicted Democrats. <laughs> also, I just thought it was funny that the more Americans know about the European Union, the more favorable view they have of it. Mm -hmm. So are Americans ignorant? Many of them are. But it isn't their fault. It's a mix of geography, American imperialism, Cold War paranoia, moral puritanism, and economic factors that create a paradoxical nation that is both the most expansive empire, but also an informational prison of their own making. God bless you stupid bastards. <laughs> Monkey brain. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. That was hella fun.